Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening for those of you who are following us from Italy and Europe. My name is Paolo Barlera. I'm the deputy director of the Italian Cultural Institute of New York, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar of presentation of the project The Other Shapes of Me by Emilio Bavarella. At the Institute, we are particularly pleased to have this presentation since this project was one of the winners of the Italian Council initiative sponsored by the Italian Ministry of Culture, uh, who, like us, uh, who belong to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, are making great efforts to promote Italian culture abroad. Um, unfortunately, as, uh, as it happened with many other things, we were supposed to have an in-person event last year, uh, exactly about a year ago uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, but of course it had to be uh, canceled. Um, but I was very happy to accept the proposal of a random association, uh, which is the uh, promoter and organizer of the uh, event to do an online presentation. And I want to thank um, Claudio Zecchi and uh, Paolo Mele, who are here with us today, and everyone else at Random who helped make this help make this possible. And I am, of course, honored to welcome today's speakers, Emilio Vavarella, uh, the artist who is going to talk about his uh, own project, Ursula Waltz, and Stephen Monteiro. Um, and now I will leave the microphone and the screen to Claudio Zecchi for a more thorough presentation of the program and our distinguished guests. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Claudio. So, uh, hi, hi, all. Thank you, Paolo, for uh, your introduction and uh, thank you all for uh, virtually being here. My name is Claudio Zecchi and I'm a curator of Random, an organization devoted to cultural and artistic production founded in 2011 by Paolo Mele and Luca Coclide and based on the very southeast of Italy in the Apulia region. So before starting the presentation of the project that as Paolo uh, said, for uh, very practical reasons, we will uh, simply call the other shapes of me which is one of the winning projects of the sixth edition of the prestigious Italian Count, uh, Council. I would like to thank the Italian Cultural Institute in New York, uh, Paolo Barlera and Mr. Uh, uh, Fabio Finotti, the new director that accepted to support and host this, uh, this event. I would also like to thank uh, Emilio Vavarella, the artist of the project that we have been uh, working with for almost two years. Ursula Volz and uh, Steven Monteiro that accepted our invitation uh, and will help us to discuss and uh, intercept, let's say, at least two different aspects that stand behind the theoretical research of the project. I also would like to thank all the people involved in the project from uh, the beautiful team of Ramdon that I today have the privilege to represent and speak on behalf of. Paolo Mele, the director, Anna Paola Presta, the project manager, Simona Casarano, the responsible of the education program, and Jessica Gastaldo, our designer. And all those that uh, in different moments so far contributed to the, to the project. And also Marinella, the mother of the artist who uh, has been part of Random's family during the time we produced the project in uh, Gagliano del Capo. A big thank also to Francesco Giaquinto, his family, and his uh, tessitura, the textile laboratory, who played uh, a crucial role in this, uh, in this project. Without them, for sure, the project would have never been done. And finally, a big thank to all the institutions that supported the project, the Italian Ministry of Culture, uh, Mambo Museum of Modern Art in Bologna, the Film Study Center, Center at Harvard University, and the uh, Art Hub. So this is the occasion for us after two exhibitions that have already took place uh, this summer in um, Gagliano del Capo and recently 
in Shanghai at Modern Art Base with the purpose to undermine different aspects of the project, uh, the research process in the case of the exhibition in Galliano and the artist's work uh, methodology in uh, Shanghai to present the project to an international audience and uh, specifically uh, the book and uh, um, that we have always considered as an extension of the project itself and the film Genesis uh, that is one of the three parts of the final artwork. Um, I uh, will try to briefly give the, the whole picture and the circumstances under which the project has been realized from its very beginning. Uh, due to its complexity, the project can be described in many, many different ways and under many different lights. Using, let's say, the institutional definition that we have uh, used for the presentation of the project so far, the work is, uh, and I quote, the result of our research into the origin of binary technology and into its most advanced application. The whole title, the source code that you see uh, on uh, my background, RS, Phi4, and so on, the other shapes of me, refers in fact to the first line of text resulting from uh, uh, the genotyping of Emilio's DNA, translated uh, into, uh, into a textile, a large fabric through the labor of his mother using a 19th century jacquard loom, which is uh, one or can be considered one of the first modern computational machine. Uh, the result is a, is a monumental, I would say gigantic work, a triptych composed of a fabric, a loom and a video that will very soon be part of the permanent collection of uh, the Mambo Museum. So now, what is, uh, what is actually interesting to describe is, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, the circumstances under which the project has been produced. The entire work uh, has been in fact produced uh, in Italy, in Galliano del Capo at uh, Tessitura Giaquinto, the textile laboratory in fact, and uh, it is a, uh, an extraordinary example of the fruitful relationship between the visual arts and the artisan tradition as a, as a choice in this case uh, of uh, existence and resistance of a territory, but it's also an extraordinary example of uh, how the territory, its resources and its potential can dialogue with uh, a wider scale and an international context. So when, uh, when I talk about the scale, I of course mean not only the uh, geographical scale, but also the reflection that can be generated through the intersection of many different disciplines that have theoretical in after the project since the very beginning. This is, a, this is in fact a very complex project that has seen random involved in many, in many aspects from uh, the very beginning. We have been, uh, accomplishes of Emilio in, uh, in the research, experimentation, and the, in the intellectual process, I, I would say. And if I have to define the other shapes of me uh, from my perspective, I would say that more than anything else, it is an expanded research laboratory, a laboratory in which different aspects enter in different moments, both from the point of view of the production of the work and the, from the point of view of the disciplines that the project has uh, intercepted, such as uh, art, philosophy, bioengineering, uh, media theory, and so on and so forth. And precisely due to its uh, experimental nature, many other aspects could, uh, could have been added. And this is why, as I mentioned before, we decided to uh, present it through a curatorial path uh, we imagine, in fact, a sort of triology that will only at least partially give back its complexity in the approach. And uh, it is exactly also for this reason that we believe since the very beginning that the book is a, a complementary extension uh, to the project. In fact, we never imagined this publication as, a, as an exhibition catalog 
but as a book in which uh, all the different disciplines just mentioned uh, find their position in, uh, let's call it the theoretical chessboard. What actually seems a project, uh, and uh, I'm pretty much sure Emilio will, uh, will talk uh, more about this, driven by uh, deterministic nature, is rather, and, I, and we will see it through the perspective that the film Genesis will offer us, a project with a, an open and deeply human nature. A nature, we will see, uh, in fact, a nature evoked by uh, both uh, by Marinella, Emilio's mother, uh, and protagonist of uh, the film, uh, while, who, while working at Tessitura Giaquinto, she establishes uh, uh, some sort of emotional exchange with uh, the machine through a set of little gestures charged with emotions and uh, small uncertainties. And uh, I would say also by the project itself, where the me that is in uh, the title uh, becomes a lens that ex uh, extends what is uh, only apparently the unique story of Emilio, but potentially becoming the story of each of us. Means this project is or can be potentially universal. Well, this is actually what uh, from random side, I would say, uh, we learn by the project. And uh, it will be nice now to have Emilio speaking about the project, giving us his perspective and let us know more about the origin, the genesis of the idea of the project. So Emilio, I leave you the, the mic. Uh, thank you, Claudio. Uh, first of all, I want to check my audio uh, because there is maybe a car crash <laughs> just outside my window right now. And I don't know if you can all hear uh, some sounds. Okay, if you can hear me, uh, I will start first of all by uh, thanking uh, the Italian Institute of Culture in New York and uh, Random for organizing this. And uh, I will also actually thank you, Claudio, for going through the very long list of credits because that will uh, save some time. I just want to say I'm extremely grateful to all the people who have contributed to this uh, project, which has been uh, long, complex, and has uh, somehow also undergone a lot of trials and tribulations caused by the current global situation. Um, I definitely want to thank both Ursula and Steven for being here today, uh, sharing with us their perspective, uh, but also for their fantastic contributions to uh, the book that Claudio just presented. Uh, I'd like to start by delving right into what the project is about. If we were to summarize the project in one sentence, uh, I would say this is a project about the conversion of my genetic code into a textile. And it is a description that, of course, omits to say a lot of very fundamental things, starting from the labor, for example, the labor of my mother, who is the person in charge of this conversion. And it omits to say what kind of technologies and techniques are used for this conversion. Uh, in this case, are the sort of like computational techniques that are uh, mobilized by a Jacquard loom, a machine that was invented at the end of the 19th century, and as Claudio also anticipated, it's often considered one of the first computers. Uh, an industrial machine that is almost entirely automated and can read software in the form of punch cards to compute information. Uh, before going into how I came up to this formulation, the idea behind the project, the genesis of the project itself, uh, I would like to uh, maybe just clarify that no one so far has seen the project in its entirety. Um, currently working both with Random, uh, with my gallery, Galleria Pew, and in collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art in Bologna, Mambo, to finally uh, present in uh, the upcoming months uh, the work in the way it was originally conceived. It will look like a triptych, a triptych composed of a jacquard loom. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the technology, it's a massive two stories high industrial machine. Uh, to this loom will be attached a textile, a textile that is over 80 meters long, and that somehow 
uh, presents and uh, embodies and codes my entire genetic code in the form of uh, uh, cotton threads, uh, which have been woven by this jacquard loom. And the jacquard loom has been modified to host uh, a film. Uh, the film is entitled Genesis, and uh, in a way it documents the production process of the textile. It shows uh, the labor of my mother. But I, I will return to this later because I think the word document is a little too limited. I think what what the film tries to do is really to communicate uh, in a larger sense uh, a whole range of emotions, concepts, and uh, embodied feelings uh, that uh, were produced as part of the production process of the textile itself. Uh, that said, um, I would just like to explain how I came to the idea of this project. Um, this project stems out of a long research on the origin of computation. As I was uh, researching what computation means, and especially the history of binary uh, technology, I came across uh, the Jacquard loom. Uh, at least the idea of the Jacquard loom, I had never seen one. And I was extremely fascinated by uh, this machine, also by the idea that the, one of the first computers was actually a machine that produced textiles. And so as I was researching uh, this incredibly fascinating story, uh, I was also working on another idea, uh, which is of course connected to the history of binarization, the history of computation, and that is the, um, the new development of, uh, of biotechnologies and uh, especially the idea of the code of life, uh, uh, something that we are all familiar with, this idea that life can be somehow presented or encoded in its entirety within a code that then is handled uh, by computers uh, who work, uh, that work in binary, in binary terms. So as I was wrapping my head around this concept uh, of binary technologies, the origin of computation, biotechnologies, genetic code, the code of life, I had the intuition of trying to feed uh, my genetic code uh, to this early computer to see what would happen when one of the longest codes associated to me, which is the code that, that according to scientists, uh, encodes my uh, genetic heritage, uh, is fed into this old uh, computer. And so that was the intuition. It was the first the starting point. Uh, then the more I worked on this idea, the more I discovered that there were other connections, so additional layers that uh, added somehow meaning and uh, added even context uh, to the project. Uh, this had to do with the history of gender, with the history of science, the history of technology, have to do with media studies, uh, with media philosophy. Uh, these are all um, disciplines of, uh, we could say, areas of expertise uh, that we tried to engage with uh, through the publication uh, that Claudio anticipated that was uh, published uh, this past summer uh, by Moose Publishing. Um, so how to connect all of these things? Uh, for me, it is always a question of finding materials and techniques uh, that can match an, a concept in the closest way possible, a certain homology of a form and content techne and logos. And so I came to the idea of asking my mother, who is the person who has already generated once uh, what we call the code of my life. She has already been in charge of generating, producing um, this code to, to do it again, to reproduce this code. So talking also about technical reproducibility, uh, the idea of negating code in different ways. Also the idea of somehow moving from the analog to the digital and then going back from the digital to the analog. And I asked my mother to work with the Jacquard Loom to compute once again uh, my genetic code to produce a large textile. At the point we had no idea what the textile would look like uh, uh, it was in fact the result of a very complex uh, research and a constant movement from the digital to the analog, a sort of like chain of negations, operations, uh, techniques, technologies that were, uh, that were 
part of a long process, uh, both conceptual and artistic. So this is how uh, I would say the main elements within uh, the project took, uh, took form. Uh, what we are going to do today is to give, uh, of course, a conceptual preview of what the idea of the project is, uh, but I also want to show the film that, as Claudio anticipated, uh, corresponds to one third of the final installation. Uh, the film is entitled uh, uh, Genesis. It talks, of course, about the genesis of this project, the production process of uh, that stays that somehow is behind the production of the textile, but it is also in a way the genesis of my code, my genesis. Uh, and uh, um, if you want, it's also a work of love, a work of love uh, for my mother and her labor, and also the love of my mother uh, for me, which somehow I think transpires by or through the care that she put into this uh, monumental and complex uh, production. So uh, without further ado, I would uh, uh, move to the film and uh, um, I would uh, now share the screen and I hope you will all enjoy uh, this. This is actually the first uh, public uh, screening of the film uh, Genesis. <laughs>
continue, uh, we will have uh, now uh, Steven's contribution. Oh, thank you, Steven. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Emilio. Um, I would um, um, uh, mention that uh, it's been a great pleasure working on this project um, and particularly contributing an essay uh, to the book. Um, I'm a culture and media scholar in the communication studies department at Concordia in Montreal. And um, I um, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Fabric of Interface, which works on the relationship, considers the relationship between the body and digital technologies and the relationship between data and labor. And so um, when, uh, when I was told about this project and had the opportunity to look at it and think about it, um, I was really uh, pleased uh, to have that opportunity. Um, one of the things that um, that I would say about uh, this this um, film is that I think it really visualizes quite beautifully the relationship between machines and uh, bodies as they're mediated by uh, binary code. And um, it's interesting how this project uh, translates the body into code, um, and then uh makes a body from that code being the being the um the textile and and one of the things that it shows as emilio brought up is the deep roots that exist um of uh digital culture's relationship to the body one of the things that i find very interesting is that with the history of computing and digital technologies is that uh, paradoxically um computing has been about removing the body. Um, and an example I would give with this is that idea of through the, the automation of the jacquard loom um, that uh, it, would, it, it would negate the need for, um, for weavers. Uh, but one of the things that we see is it also computing um, constantly relies on the body. Um, and we see that in the film with um, the loom tender and the work uh, that Emilio's mother is doing through all of these different steps of the process. And so one of the things that um, interests me um, is thinking about those relationships today in part in how they uh, relate to uh, the past. And so one of the things that we can think about today is just as we see uh, the loom, uh, um, Emilio's mother doing all of that work um, with the machine, to produce uh, this uh, this uh, object and allow that process to happen is the uh, work that we all do today, the labor that we all do today, um, a, the sort of immaterial labor of uh, working with our touch screens and our various devices um, to connect different pieces of data together and to make things. Um, and it's very much a bodily process. You think of touch screens, you think of gestural interfaces, um, all of these kinds of uh, things. And even today, more and more, um, um, the way that facial recognition is being used to, um, uh, to create data. So a couple of things, I, so sort of taking what the, the, the Emilio's project and thinking about the sorts of things that, that I work on and how it relates, that project relates to things that we should think about today. Uh, a couple of things that I, I, I would, um, have been thinking about is, is thinking about how we use media today as personal media. And um, we can think about our smartphones and our smart watches and, and these kinds of objects. And they produce certain relationships between the machine, the device, and, and the body. Um, and relationships between the body and networks and data and production of data from the body through the device. And so we can think about it as personal media in a couple of ways. One, one is that these are portable individualized objects like the smartphone um, that go with us everywhere and have, have very nearly become a part of, of us and our, our physical material practices as well as sort of the, our, 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 our psyche in everyday life. The second thing about this is, is thinking about it's personal in the sense that it collects data 
more and more of these devices collect data tied to our bodies, changing physical states and actions. A couple of examples of this would be just with um, location sensing and so GPS, cell phone pinging and these kinds of things that can track our body as we move with the device through uh, physical space. Another example, which I think is interesting with particularly with this work is the increasing use of different kinds of health and fitness apps. So Google Fit on a smartphone, um, the apps on an Apple Watch, using a Fitbit, these sorts of things. And when we think about these, uh, they measure more and more aspects of our physical being and the processes of our body. Um, things like uh, measuring heartbeat, breathing rate, the oxygen levels in our blood, um, our walking uh, speed and rate, the number of steps that we've taken in the day, uh, our amount of rest time, the quality of our sleep. All of these things can be monitored by these devices. And what it's not just monitoring them, but it's producing data that then is analyzed by machines in the network, right, on servers. So we have this constant monitoring of the body um, and converting of physiological processes into binary code and data. Um, and this brings up a couple of concerns uh, that uh, uh, we can think about. One is of course uh, privacy. And so thinking about how our intimate uh, biomedical details um, are shared on networks. And part of this of course is the way that these personal devices and the networks and the platforms that we use encourage us to share our information about ourselves. So there's that issue of privacy and that our body data becomes um, not just coded, but commodified as well. That there's a value on this data that's collected of just our very being and, and, and our physical sort of existence in the world. And the second part of that is the extent to which perhaps, and this is something to look at in the future coming out of this work that, that Emilio um, has presented, is thinking about the extent to which our bodies will become more and more adapted, are becoming more and more adapted to algorithms. So in essence, the devices in monitoring our body and giving us feedback based on the analyses that it makes, um, more and more sort of uh, the device weaves us out of our bodily data that it collects to produce a certain image of ourselves in the real world and us, that it asks us to adhere to or to produce. What this, the interesting thing about this for me is that it's, that is much like the way that the 19th century moon in the other shapes of me weaves a textile from Emilio's genetic code, that we find this, the code sort of coming back to sort of produce a certain kind of physical existence for each of us based on um, the data that it collects from our body and how it sort of um, analyzes that to produce other data that then affects who we are and, and what we do and how we, and how we lead our lives. So in that regard, I found this project really, really fascinating and and, and, and um, interesting the way that it intersects, not just with my work, but also with certain questions that exist today about the relationship between um, computing um, and the body and the collection of data and um, sense, of, sense of identity and so. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Stephen and uh, um, I would like to now leave the microphone to Ursula. Emilio, thank you. Um, this has been an amazing experience. Um, and uh, uh, my background is as a computer science educator, and I have been teaching about how to write code since about 1989, and technically all the way back to 1978, but that's a different story. Um, but I am also a crafter. And among other things today, I have some weaving and some um, uh, patchwork uh, quilting that various friends have done. 
And what I want to talk about is this notion of crafting and computing, and especially in, in the context of um, the film where there was an immense amount of time taken to set up the loom, but once the loom got going, uh, we went pretty good, pretty well. Um, my shtick about code crafting is that we launched a website in July 28th of, of, of 2019 um, for a SIGGRAPH studio installation that was invited to allow people to explore how quickly you could learn to code um, using a language called Turtle Stitch on domestic embroidery machines. So the, the site, I'm going to read this one because this is my shtick. Um, the site presents the audacious assertion that computer programming coding concepts originated not with the jacquard loom, um, but millennia ago through textile production of crocheting, embroidery, quilting, weaving, um, and knitting. And we are exploring how these crafts influence and inform computer science. And we're doing this both in the classroom and in all kinds of um, community-based activities. So let's start with crocheting. What we use crocheting for um, is that in classes at three different colleges, each student in a code crafting class contributed an individual granny square to the whole, which we pieced together. Lessons included reading patterns, executing, debugging, modifying patterns, as well as modu a modular approach um, to thinking about how we do collaborative computer science. Um, in December 2020, just a few, few months back, um, we explored how we can start with patterns and collectively create a charitable goal to produce a to produce a dynamic network. Our goal was not so much to create a lot of hats. Our goal was to bring a community together when we weren't really able to meet in person and share the kind of intimacy that, that we normally have. And so in December, Arlene Marin, um, a good friend of mine, and I organized knitters throughout Essex County to produce 50 hats for our guests at the Montclair Emergency Services for the Homeless. We produced 117, crocheted, knitted, and sewn by 17 women. 24 families and individuals donated over $500 for materials. And seven people joined us to learn to knit or crochet. Um, we still have hats to give away if you're interested. So, um, Machine embroidery gave us a different take on coding and crafting. Um, and these images were produced through Andrea Mayer Stadler's Turtle Stitch and the, the connection is there. Um, Turtle Stitch is being used worldwide, but machine embroidery really provides a vehicle for exploring single thread algorithms, a different, different from weaving, okay, but single thread algorithms, literally. It also highlights how visualizations is an, is an approximation for reality. What you can see on here is a couple of the images have, have raised feel, and you don't see that in the visualization. You lose information sometimes when you are putting things on a computer screen. Um, Arlene leads a group called the Crazy Quilters, and um, in Montclair, New Jersey, and she taught me how to piece together embroidery squares to create a vehicle for sharing group work. As a retired IT professional, she and I, and she helped me see the connections between quilt construction and software development. Um, and this was best illustrated by the, the, the quilt that appeared last, which was produced by Anne Marie Weber's alternative math class in Bennington, Vermont. These are kids who were targeted as, as likely not to graduate from high school. And by building this quilt, they fulfilled their math requirement. And they learned volumes. We have hours and hours of, of um, information about that. So one of the things that, that the patchwork inspired was taking a look at how traditional modes of constructing a two-dimensional piece can influence 
the way we think about images on the screen and perhaps also image recognition. And also to put a little tweak on the way that image rec recognition works. And so what we have here is a classic um, friendship pattern um, rendered as a collection of images. And we're just starting to explore this. And one of the things we noticed when we, when we did this patchwork on the computer was that there's something missing. Something's missing. And what we realized is this has to do with texture and feel. And so we started articulating as a result of, of working with, with Emilio's um, projects over the last year, um, that while code is a language for sharing information, okay, and while modern media increases information sharing through sight and sound, it diminishes how we learn through touch, taste, and smell. And this is especially true for how we sense vo woven textiles when we cannot touch them. Um, so how do we represent what fabric feels like? Um, all computer science gives us at the moment is a collection of attribute value pairs. Okay, textile designers have a language to, to describe how fat fabric feels, and this is a tiny subset. Okay, um, they will contrast samples not by putting things together in separate categories, like these are fluffy, these are silky. Okay, but they will compare pieces and say essentially, this one is fluffier, but the other one is silkier, but why is that important? Okay. And so unlike machine learning algorithms, what they're doing is not putting things into buckets. Okay. They're comparing things. They're looking at the trade-offs between individuals. And I'm going to posit, especially after watching the film a couple of times, that that's what we're missing. Okay, my insight, today um, is that setup is profoundly hard, okay? And once it's there, we can produce the same pattern over and over and over again, okay? But modern computing isn't really looking at how do we differentiate between individuals? And that leads back to what Stephen said about our privacy and our, and our DNA, okay? How do we organize structures of DNA to make draw conclusions. And Kathy O'Neill talks about that in um, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. Okay, what happens when we get the code wrong? Okay. So um, Ar Arlene and my kids, Chris Dunn and Kai Dunn and I started to explore this. Um, and I will admit we did this almost immediately after Emilio invited me to join this. So this work is less than a month old. Okay. And so Arlene and I collected about 60 pieces of fabric that we had in our, our fabric stash. Every crafter has a fabric stash. And Kai photographed them all and got them on the computer. And then Chris created a quick and dirty little slider app where Kai was able to go in there and rate each piece of fabric. And what's interesting about this is it took about as long for us to do that whole process, basically a month, as it did for Chris, with a little bit of help for me um, to write the apps. So when we started, we were waiting for the images. And so what Chris did is he explored some of these attribute relationships by organizing colors. And the idea behind the purple is that it's a gradation between red and blue. And again, in my head, I had an idea of how we wanted to separate things, but I couldn't really imagine how this might work for eight attributes or more like the 50. And this first image was not very productive. We felt that doing this in a, in a circle was going to make some more sense. And so we tried that and that gave us some promise. And so our next vision was that we would organize the pictures this way. And so that's where we ended up. So here are all our images. And what you can see from this is that they keep or reorganizing themselves around the buttons that are down at the bottom. And 
And you can see that under certain cir circumstances, there are outliers and that there's a lot of clustering. And we're happy with this. Okay, this is only a week old or so. But it was the first attempt at trying to understand how vision and animation and interactivity can allow us to think about the relationship purely around the feel of the fabric. Okay. And so this is where, to prevent me from talking for an hour, um, I want to make sure that I say this one really carefully. Okay. Um, this is interesting, but the textures are more alike than different. And the outliers are there, but barely. Okay. And so we started thinking about, do we need more control to compare two things? Okay. But we're also not completely convinced that our code is correct. And we're also curious about how visualizing this in 3D and being able to move around them um, might help us. Okay, but finally, there's this question of the integrity of the data, which Stephen hinted at, and which is there in the, in the film and the book, but we don't really talk about this. It's this idea of privacy, okay? So Kai raided the squares late one night after a full day at work. Is her opinion sufficient? to categorize these things. Okay, we've just introduced the idea of bias, the potential bias in our algorithm. Should we crowdsource it? What if we got hundreds of people to use the Raider? But the problem there is, how do we get the fabric to them? And the fabrics are going to be different because, well, there's all kinds of physical stuff there. Okay. And then finally, why in the world do we care? Okay, okay, so this is interesting, but why do we need to feel fabric? Okay. And so by trying to explore how do we, we represent fabric, are we simply going down a rabbit hole to follow a shiny object, which being an AI researcher, I can say, yeah, we do that all the time. Okay. Now, the reason for it is the textile manufacturers would die for a tool that shortcuts sending swatches to customers, okay, or having customers visit their factory in China, especially now. Okay. On the other hand, when we finally got this running, I sat there and played for two hours trying to understand both how to control it and how to make it beautiful. Okay, so in the end, all right, this is about the shape of me. And it's about the shape of art and about how code ultimately limits our ability to experience the world. Emilio, again, thank you for this. Um, I gained a lot from, from doing this talk, including never trust Zoom. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Ursula, and it was very interesting to hear you both um, giving us some more insight of the project. This is a really an ongoing project, uh, and uh, I think this is uh, the power of the project uh, as a in its nature as a research and experimental project. Project is a, a launching question that we on our side try to respond, but I think there are many others that uh, can, be, can be made. And, uh, and this is, was also the challenge when uh, we decided uh, we start uh, conversating, we start uh, talking with the million at the very beginning of the project. Uh, picking a million was a, was a challenge actually, because uh, he's an artist, but he's also a researcher and we, 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 we knew since the very beginning that we were kind of uh, at, at the cusp of uh, this uh, uh, strange situation of being uh, between uh, uh, an experimental project and an art project. But I, I think this, uh, this was a good challenge. And this, this was, uh, at least for me, a, a very big challenge to be pushed to 
uh, to, to also enter in a world that for me is always a little bit, uh, uh, yes, challenging maybe is the, is the, good, uh, is the good word. Uh, I only use devices uh, to kind of, uh, um, as, a, as a help uh, for my uh, daily life. But uh, as I said, this, uh, the power of this project is, uh, it has been launched in question and many others could have uh, been launched during the project. And uh, maybe this is also uh, a good platform to kind of uh, uh, sharing ideas if you want in this moment or uh, uh, asking questions, or uh, if you want Emilio and I, we can go uh, through some Q&A. Uh, some Q &A. Um, Claudio, thank you. Um, I would like to offer maybe just one quick um, remark. It's not necessarily an answer, but you know, drawing from both Stevens and Ursula's presentations, I got so many ideas. And uh, so first, first of all, I want to preface the fact that as an artist, when, when we artists put our work out there, it can uh, easily turn into a sterile moment when you feel like you are done, your work is over, the project is complete. Uh, for me as a researcher, I always want to keep the exchange open. And even uh, today, presenting my film, it becomes the opportunity to then learn something new from the perspective of other people. And that I just want to like underline how important that is uh, for me and how relevant I think it becomes for an art practice that has a more expanded social value. Uh, it becomes really a platform through which people can uh, share their own work, converse, ch challenge each other, uh, address larger mm -hmm. issues. Uh, and so talking about issues, for example, it was very interesting for me to see how there was a connection between these last two interventions that had to do with the idea of the body. And this is not something that we planned in advance, but uh, Stephen, you talked about the removal of the body uh, at the beginning of technology, this idea of really like removing the biological forms, which is something that I, I have also encountered many times. And just this past week, for example, I was looking at 17th century mechanics and I found the design of an automatic lathe that had been built or designed, not built, designed by Descartes. And he designed it in such a way that there was no space for a human to actually operate it. It was just a self-autonomous machine, self-enclosed. And that was really the, the idea of this technology that don't require human intervention. And yet, you know, also going through the theoretical excursus that you, uh, created for us then there was this idea of rethinking the body even as, almost as a sort of like technological infrastructure from which uh, data is extracted is elaborated and then is uh, it becomes a commodity and so it becomes part of a larger uh, exchange system and then also you were talking about the sort of like the lacking of bodily perception uh, mm -hmm. within coding and computing in a more uh, general sense, which is uh, also something that I think we, we touched upon with the project. I think the film was a response to that feeling. I didn't put it into words, but I definitely shared the same sort of like this friction uh, with the idea of, uh, Claudio, for example, talked about the sense of um, over determination that sometimes code brings up the, the feeling that everything will be determined by the code itself and that will be you know a closed uh, circle in a way and we wanted to break open that circle we wanted to create a little more ambiguity more room for projection projecting ourselves and I feel like thinking about the work you're you just started Ursula and trying to bring back into coding things like impressions, feelings, mm -hmm. uh, judgment, like that it means like bringing back both epistemology, but also aesthetics. Uh, right. Those are the things that computers have more trouble simulating. And somehow they kind of like mark the limit of computation. And was still, I think, at least in my opinion, characterizes what it means to be human. We, we sort of have like 
reduce the amount of things that we can claim as properly human. But I think when it comes to epistemology and aesthetics, we can still, you know, claim some authority. And it feels like your work is going in that direction too. So I just, yeah, mm -hmm. it was just a general, uh, general observation. I found your contributions very interesting. Thank you. Well, if, if I can follow up on that, Emilio, I, you know, I'm, I'm singing your pra praises here and I will say it because you, you didn't in, in your modesty is that the first time I saw the movie, I cried because it did, it had that, that, that balance between the natural and the human and the, um, the, we call it the fur, but all of the, the fabric, all that stuff. Okay. That's part of it, of, of a textile lab, whether it's something informal, like what I have here, or whether it's a, it's a factory and this rigid machine. Um, and things haven't changed very much in terms of the interplay. Okay. We're still in this position. Every time your mother's hand went near certain moving parts, I shuddered because I have relatives who've lost fingers in that process. Okay. Um, I have been struggling with the limitations of computing because I've had, I've had to defend a, I've had to defend AI. Um, and I've also had to um, teach very ambitious young people, uh, mostly white men, um, that they're not going to solve all the world's problems by coding without thinking carefully about the data. And, you know, and, and again, Stephen really focused on that. And I think that's just so important right now. And I think that your work has opened up a, a dialogue for talking about that outside of the elite company of the people who are dominating our lives with their, with their apps. Um, and so thank you, this was so much fun. And you're absolutely right. Um, what I'm hammering on right now is this idea that all we have is an attribute value pair. And I didn't understand that a month ago, so I'm grateful for that. Okay, and everything else we build on the computer comes out of that, even your DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I'm I'm confident that 50 years from now, the way that we um, represent our DNA and the detail in which we talk about how it inter interacts with the proteins and everything that manage it um, is going to be profoundly different than what we're doing now. And I'm looking forward to that version of the of the your tapestry. I want to see the thing in, in whole. I'm really anxious to see it. I will be, I will be very happy to share it as soon as it's installed. Oh. Yeah, hopefully this will happen in, uh, in one month time, if we will be able to, uh, to do it. And, and yes, uh, I mean, this idea of the materiality was pretty much clear when we were in uh, Galliano del Capo one year ago, producing the project and, uh, we, we've been, uh, I think, I may say, over, overwhelmed by the materiality mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of the project, and we, we sense it. It was uh, pretty clear to, to all of us, and uh, for me, that was the most powerful uh, um, experience. In fact, uh, for example, this is very personal, but it's always, uh, we, we share a little bit some, some ideas uh, about this with uh, with Emilio, uh, I'm usually writing uh, very analytic text, but I was not able in this case to be that analytic uh, at the point, you know, to make some critical uh, theoretical critical uh, uh, insight. Uh, for me, it was uh, really a human experience, and the way I wrote the text was really the translation of my experience last year in uh, Galliano del Capo. Uh, while producing the project uh, in the text I wrote for, and my contribution for the uh, for the catalyst, so I, I'm glad I had the, the, the that experience, and uh, it was really really powerful. And I'm pretty much sure that you, in a way, uh, could all uh, sense you know this materiality and this uh, uh, through the the the, the, the film. Uh, Genesis that was really was really powerful. I don't know if you, Stephen, want to to add some more things, uh, go back on topics, or uh, asking us uh, something. Or uh... I I had one thing I wanted to say. I thought was um, really um, 
um, interesting is, is Emilio, what you said at the end there about thinking and, and specifically in addressing some of the things that Ursula had brought up, that idea of aesthetics and epistemology are, are still some of those more and more reduced areas mm -hmm. where we can really say that those are, those remain more or less the domain of the human or what it is to be human and that those things haven't been ceded so much to um uh to 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 ai and i think what what you just brought up as well claudio talking about how this project worked particularly when it's one that's focused on the history of computing and uh the development of uh, binary code and the ways that binary code have shaped the world, right? Um, that it's interesting in talking about how the, the your sort of approach to the project, that aspect of th those things that are sort of physical um, um, physical aspects that, that can't be worked around, let's say, in any sort of analytical way and can't be worked around in any kind of um, 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 shift, to, shift to some kind of digital solution or digital alternative. Um, and that's one of the things that I find really interesting. And it's also with, with the work that you're doing, Ursula, which is really fascinating, um, is um that that even uh, you know, what's interesting about these kinds of projects is is that what we see in sort of the failures or difficulties of the project is where we see sort of the the the, the you know the the richness of um of the of the human experience mm -hmm. and and human capabilities and human intervention um and creativity and 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 all of these things um so in that regard, I mean, I think there were there were some very interesting sort of I, I, ideas coming out of this, as you said, Emilio, that that were not necessarily the intention of, of any of us in sort of coming, you know, coming coming together to around around this event and this and this work. Yes, and uh, if I may add one thing that is, uh, I think, very much linked to what you just finished to say, uh, Stephen. Uh, at the very beginning, when we launched the project, we very much stressed this idea of uh, a performative project that at, the, at some point disappeared and I think uh, came back in, an, uh, in, a, in another way. It was really a very performative project, uh, the way, and um, I don't want to use the, the, the word performative in the, uh, like in the in the art uh, uh, meaning, but it was really more an, yes an experience, and this was this was really really powerful. But I think Emilio, I don't know, I propose you uh, this again to use uh, uh, to use uh, to use performative uh, as a as a as a good way to describe uh, maybe what we experienced uh, uh, back. Uh, uh, back in Galliano to give a sense at least of uh, um, you know uh, the the day uh, we the days we produce the the project. Yeah, I mean, what I like about the term performance uh, is that it really puts the emphasis on the process, and this was a very mm -hmm. process oriented project. Uh, uh, everything was a process. Everything is still a process. Uh, uh, I think even the way we explain the project every time we ask to do so, it's a working process. <laughs> like, how do we do it? Because it can, as you said at the beginning, it can be done in a, a number of different uh, ways. Uh, and I think also talking in terms of performance really somehow puts the spotlight away from the final product uh, to what comes before and after. Mm -hmm. And that for me is extremely important. Uh, and that again puts emphasis on research. Uh, and uh, research is what I'm fascinated uh, and with. And how can I say, maybe I, I don't think I've ever said this, but in a way, it's almost uh, trying to do research with a certain kind of research with the only tools uh, 
that are available for that specific kind of research. And that maybe answers the question like why I did this uh, and why I did it this way. Because in a way, this was the only way to do it. Uh, and this was the best way I could uh, come up with uh, to address the many questions uh, that somehow we have touched upon. Uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, to also create the sort of like general infrastructure that hopefully will allow other people to ask more questions. Well, yeah. where, where I'd like really like to commend you for this is that, you know, the, the common paradigm in science right now, um, because we can collect so much data, is to just take all the data, take all the spaghetti, and throw one of them at the wall and say, okay, it's stuck, we must be right. Um, and, you know, I, I just finished doing some stuff with, with trying to teach data analytics and, and machine learning. And it kept coming back to this notion of it will work if we have enough data. It will work if we have enough data. And what you just said is just so important, is that sometimes digging deep on one thing, on your DNA, can provide more insight and more knowledge and more advancement of understanding than if you had taken the DNA of 4,000 people and thrown it at the wall. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I totally agree. Okay. One, um, thing, one I just would bring up is that if we think about, I think performance is important here, and thinking about the relationship between performance and process, right. because some of the things that we're talking about are performance that 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 and and the pro the process that produces certain kinds of performance. So I, I think that also is an interesting thing that comes comes out of out of this project. Yeah, but this was actually also the challenge for us as curators of the project, trying to give back this uh, uh, potentiality of, uh, of the project, this uh, in and out, this non-linear way of Emilio, of Emilio to approach to, to, the, to the project. That was interesting. This is why we thought about the you know the curatorial path of the of the project as a sort of trilogy, just to um, make it even more clear uh, what we what we've done uh, uh, in uh, one and a half year uh, following Emilio uh, Emilio's project and uh, uh, also stressing this uh, experimental. Uh, um, potentiality of the project and the, the, ten, the tendency, I would say, also to kind of, of uh, failure. Uh, yeah, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is why this is why we we we, we thought and we approached from uh, the curatorial perspective uh, in a in a way that uh, maybe if I have to translate it in a uh, in a in a image, uh, the device or uh, which is also. <laughs> pretty much uh, um, important uh, methodolog methodological way to approach the uh, the project the device. This is why we ask uh, Jessica to to design a specific design, uh, device, for example, in uh, for the uh, the exhibition in uh, in Galliano del Capo last year. But is uh, I would say the the core of uh, the curatorial approach. And the only way we, we found, at least, to kind of give back this complexity and this, uh, you know, all these layers that the project bring with it. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't know, is uh, already one and a half hour we, we talk about the project. I'm very sorry, I have to uh, cut the conversation. I don't know if you, Paolo Barlera, want to add what, one more uh, thing uh, uh, now. Uh, otherwise, I hope uh, uh, this will be the occasion uh, to, uh, this will be a starting point for us uh, to kind of continue the conversation um, over Emilio's project and other project if, uh, if possible. And uh, thank you very much again for uh, accepting uh, our invitation. And uh, that's all. And uh, I don't know, Paolo, if you want to want to yeah, say something. I just want to thank everybody for, for participating and giving this, your uh, very valuable thoughts about this project. Uh, and uh, encourage uh, Emilio to continue on his uh, 
career, both as a, a PhD student and uh, as an artist, and also random to uh, continue their uh, support of uh, young artists, Italian art, young artists. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.